Um, I've heard some things about maybe you don't want to stretch before you go out and like try like a peak performance because it might like decrease power. Um, I, you know, how do you look at kind of holistically if I have limited time, where should my my highest focus be? So at a high level, uh, flexibility is something that should be worked on all year long in an ideal scenario, but it will always come down to time resource. So if you already have a level of flexibility, which isn't a huge limitation in your climbing performance, then you would probably argue that putting in a lot of time on flexibility isn't the best use of your time. And perhaps you might take just one or two exercises, which are more key to your performance or the project that you might have. So I think that's firstly, really important to recognize. Secondly, is the point around timing of flexibility and, you know, some of this folklore about not doing stretching before high intensity sessions or, or strength sessions because there may be a reduction in power. If you look at the research on this, what you'll find is that the studies for the greater part see reductions in power. So this kind of speed, high intensity speed or more moderate intensity speed element um, of performance, but only within a short, quite a short window. So I think most of the studies see reductions up to around 20, 20 minutes after stretching. Mm -hmm. But if you do your stretching and you come to doing a high intensity session two hours later or one hour later, I think for the greater part, you aren't going to see any effect. And arguably, in almost all cases, the net loss from not getting on with doing some flexibility training that could be so beneficial to your training just because you're worrying about some lack of power that you might have in your session is just it's, it's like you, you you're you're backing the wrong horse you you're concentrating right. on the wrong thing so i think that uh, and i know i've written articles on it and i've said this a number of times in interviews that people just need to get over this part of the the flexibility folklore element. Um, it's almost like it's an excuse for people to not do it because climbers love their strength and power. For sure. Um, and in terms of the best sessions to do and and where you'll see the best effects with flexibility, on the whole, longer, more concentrated, intentional sessions that will push both the range of uh, movement that you have in a particular joint, but also have time to develop strength throughout that range of movement. Because you don't want to do flexibility just in a sort of a static pushing yourself to a limit. You actually want to work strength throughout that range. That's going to be where you will long term get the biggest bang for buck. Um, and that sort of training can be actually done on a very similar kind of modality to strength training that you might do it on every fourth day of the week and you can actually have a reasonable amount of time off between those sessions because hard flexibility sessions do make you sore and you need time to recover from them and people can can get into these cycles where they get too obsessed with their, their flexibility training and almost get reductions in flexibility because they're never recovered and they're overtraining their flexibility right so so that's where i put the kind of yeah your money if you had limited time on it but in a ideal world, any athlete should take somewhat of a varied regime, which means that it's more motivating and you have a change in stimulus and you have different sessions that you can do. And it's not always hard and grueling. It, you know that you can look forward to some days where you've got your midday dynamics and you've got a quick 15 minute session and that's okay. You're still kind of getting your training stimulus, but it's not too hardcore. And that on the whole, in terms of how we work with athletes, will be the way that we get the longest term buy-in and ultimately results from doing that, rather than just hammering people really hard every single session. All right, y'all, just a quick 30-second shout-out here for today's sponsor, which is the Crimped app, and I'm telling you, I love Crimped. Long before there was a YouTube channel, I was using Crimped to program my training because it takes the guesswork out of things. We're too busy to worry about this stuff. Open up Crimped, you can either load in a program, like a sport plan or a boulder plan, or you can choose from the hundreds of exercises and protocols that they have in there to figure out your week. And at the end of each day and at the end of each week, you get to check them off. You know what's happening. You know what's coming. It will level up your training. I love it so much. Check it out. Hit that link. You can download it for free. All right, let's get back to the interview. 
Um, if I'm going to spend 45 minutes working my hips in X, Y, Z manner or, or my upper body, um, how does that kind of directly translate to certain movements on the wall? Well, ultimately it comes down to is that, and when we're specifically talking about here, the increase in hip flexibility is that that factor will enable you to be able to get your center of gravity so the kind of the, the center mass point of your body closer to the wall so that you're one able to stand over your feet more but two is that you're able to kind of move that that center of mass through a sort of like a trajectory like almost like throwing a tennis ball and it go to the top of the the loop of the throw and then back down is you're able to get through that kind of throw or loop of momentum into the perfect position where you're kind of hitting that dead point to the greatest efficiency on any particular move and naturally you're going to need the limit of efficiency if you're trying things at your limit if i'm doing cruising around on circuits which aren't that hard for me i don't need to move that efficiently because i've got loads of spare capacity in the tank and such but if i'm doing really hard bouldering or going down to the gym and doing the circuit that says, you know, my my limit circuit, I have to be climbing really, really efficiently. And to do that, I need to be weighting my feet extremely well. I need to be able to get my hips into a position that are biomechanically efficient so I can actually pull properly on my heels or pull properly on my toes or rock my hips through that kind of line of efficiency, efficient trajectory on the wall. And then I'm going to complete the moves. And that's where I'm going to notice it because if I come down to the next part on the, the sort of like the step of styles of climbing that I said there was an effect of, so the next one was slab climbing, is that a lot of slab climbing, there might be two moves that are quite hard and I am going to see a limitation on those and depending on where I can get my hips. But quite often you'll find yourself then in positions where you completely can rest and you get a lot of energy back. And so you don't really feel the inefficiency quite as acutely as seven very hard moves right up a bouldering wall where every single one you have to execute to perfection and that's why you're going to see that difference did you you worked with will you know going into burden of dreams and there's you know some moves there where you're throwing a really high right foot and and you know when he was working on training for that or when you're working with other clients who are working on super high end powerful boulder problems like that uh, how much is mobility and flexibility a part of that training for the vast majority of climbers at the elite end it won't it won't form a large focus within their training because they already have a very good degree of flexibility they will simply be in maintenance mode and often they'll achieve a lot of that just by climbing on the wall and constantly working the full range of moment uh, movement you look at Will, he's got really good flexibility. A lot of people don't really notice it because, again, it doesn't turn up on Instagram a lot. Guys don't tend to post photos of them doing their flexibility sessions or their right. yoga sessions. <laughs> um, but go to any of the athletes on the international competition circuit, like Toby Roberts, you look at him, extremely good level of flexibility. Max Milner, extremely good level of flexibility. Alex Magos. Hey, Alex Magos, you know, like he's a pretzel. It, it, <laughs> I don't like, I don't know how he did. It's yoga, I think, but like, yeah, that guy's foot will go straight above his head. I'm so psyched now. I'm so psyched to get into this hip flexibility. <laughs> Is it going to help me moonboard better? That's really all I need to know, Tom. No, <laughs> oh, shit. That's where the fingers come in. <laughs> no, it'll help. A, it'll help a tiny bit. It will help with some moves, but yeah, I mean, uh, here, here's an interesting point. Um, if you are a really inflexible climber and you hate flexibility and you never want to work on it all of your life, but you want to climb your hardest grades, stick to a board. Hmm. That, that's the one place where you will not really have your limitations called out um, and you can get away with a pretty high degree of inflexibility. That's terrible news for me because I'm also not strong enough, uh, powerful enough to climb on a board. So I think what I need to do now is get more flexible so I can, <laughs> I can shine in other areas. 